and that is the unknown and the big unknown, the great unknown for all of us is death. And um, this is what Judith Carlyle is going to be discussing um, in a moment. And I think in a way, Judith is uniquely uh, qualified for this. Her great compassion, um, which we see all the time with her, you know, her, her work with animals, with people. Um, when, when death closes in on us, are we really ready? How do we transform this terrible idea of, of, of some kind of annihilation into a fruitful moment for us to learn from and benefit from? Uh, Judith creates uh, this, what she, called from, she calls a kind of a model from the Dharmic traditions where we can actually give death meaning and death can give meaning to our life as our life can give meaning to our death. So this is really a wonderful uh, way to um, move into another kind of uh, artistic moment. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll hand it over to Judith to elaborate on these uh, existential uh, questions. Hi, let me just take one moment also and put up my presentation. There it is. And let me make it be a slideshow. So, um, hi, I'm Judith Carlisle. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to present this thesis. It's titled Choosing a Better Death, Yoga as a Path to Create a Meaningful Life. And um, let me look at the thesis here. Um, the project um, supports this proposition that the relationship of the Western world to death has become impoverished and anxiety-ridden and fearful. And in order to address this issue, the thesis makes and supports the following proposition. Um, in, intentional contemplation and preparation for death is the impetus for creating a more meaningful life and that establishing a robust relationship with death is both necessary and primary for the creation of a meaningful life. So constructing a meaningful life is much more difficult and impaired in the absence of a healthy um, relationship with death. The presentation is going to proceed this way. I'm going to look at three different topics, death in the West, Dharmic traditions in death, and death is an opportunity. The first two factors that contribute to the um, diminished value of death are considered. And these are the Protestant ethic and the Calvinist doctrine as they're presented by Max Weber. The second is how reliance on empirical science has caused death to become devalued. Next, the thesis explores uh, philosophies and beliefs about death and dying from the perspectives of three Dharmic traditions, yoga, Jainism, and Buddhism. But today in this presentation, I'm concerned with only one of those traditions, the yogic perspective. We're using, I'm going to use the Bhagavad Gita to look at Arjuna's evolving relationship with death. I'm emphasizing how we must gain a more personal relationship with death in order to comprehend how he must live in the world. In order to explain how one might intentionally construct a meaningful life, I turn to Frankel's logotherapy. Finally, as the thesis was conceived to consider how intentionally coming to a better understanding of death in later years can be achieved um, two stages of the Hindu ashram of the household or retirement years will be considered if I have time to get there. And this thesis uh, flips the wisdom about the relationship between life and death, because typically we focus on life first as a way of finding meaning in life. But I look at death as a meaningful construct that gives meaning to life. So if I say that the Western concept of death is impoverished, I need to address how this came about how death became devalued. And two factors are offered here. First, the Protestant ethic and the Calvinist doctrine that accompanies it. And second, the dogmatic pursuit of empirical science. Briefly, the Calvinist ethic, uh, the, the Calvinist doctrine of predestination eliminates the need for faith and the impetus to live a good life in order to attain salvation. This shifts the pursuit of worldly status from a purposeful undertaking into the acquisition of wealth for wealth's sake. Why? The Protestant ethic combined with the Calvinist doctrine takes financial wealth as an indication that one resides in God's grace. In economic woes, Mark I is excluded from that grace, but in the absence of a Protestant God, acquiring wealth becomes merely the pursuit of wealth. And death is devalued as its only outcome is the termination of opportunities for acquisition. Acquisition of wealth become the meaning of life, 
death ends up shutting one off from the meaning of life. I also offer the elevation of empirical science to a status where it's the only valid tool that can be used to investigate and verify reality as a contributing factor to the diminished value of death. If death is a reality, then it defies the methodological requirements of empirical science, as there's little to no experiential data, really no evidence at all, um, available to analyze and direct conclusions. Because death cannot be investigated using empirical methods to explore reality, Death is excluded as an important part of the real world. It becomes devoid of value. Further, theoretical constructs that can be investigated using empirical methods, consider death anxiety, fear of death, and ways to avoid death altogether are all negative and frightening. And I suggest that each of these act to, develop, uh, act to devalue death while adding value to the pursuit of life. I'm going to take just a moment here to reemphasize that death is a primary focal point here. Death precedes life as a meaning, as a means to constructing meaning. And in order to see this relationship, I present some thoughts on the Bhagavad Gita. So looking at this schematic of Arjuna's maturing relationship with death, three stages are shown. The first one at the bottom uh, shows, we see that Arjuna begins with a naive and abstract concept of death. We move to the middle seeing that as, our, as Krishna counsels Arjuna about his own nature and the nature of reality, Arj, Arjuna's conceptualization of death becomes more, personally, more personal and it considers Arjuna's relationship with Krishna as death. And finally, Arjuna releases his delusional understanding of his death. We reach the top. Over and over again, we hear that the Bhagavad Gita is about Arjuna confronting the denial of his dharma, eventually coming to act upon it. And I want to suggest a different sub-reading of the tale. Arjuna's understanding moves from knowing death only as an abstract concept, the culmination of his potential acts that will result in the destruction of his friend's family and of those he holds in esteem, as well as a thing with the added potential to destroy the orderliness of the world. That is something that Arjuna hasn't really considered and when confronted with it, he sees it as something that will affect only other people as something that he can make happen or not. Arjuna proceeds to develop a personal relationship with death as it's embodied by Krishna and through Krishna's teachings. Arjuna comes to see that he is not the cause of death, that death is Krishna's to give. Arjuna's actions would not be wrong, nor would they be destructive. His actions understood in the correct context merely reflect and enact Krishna's will. Arjuna comes to see that his actions can bring about physical death and that this death is not fearful and that the fearful thing is the cycle of rebirth that will be perpetuated again and again as the outcome of wrong actions. Arjuna's ability to grasp his dharma comes only after he builds this personal relationship with death. Arjuna's conceptualization of death begins to evolve and change as he builds his personal relationship with death. In chapter 10, which Sargent, the translation that I'm using, identifies as the yoga of manifestation, as his, um, Krishna begins to reveal himself through various manifestations. Krishna comes, uh, Arjuna comes to see Krishna not only as his companion, but as his guide and as his supreme man. Krishna evinces a great many manifestations, notably encompassing the identity of Yama, the god of death saying that um, essentially, I am Yama of the controllers, identifying himself thusly. Arjuna comes to see Krishna as much more than a companion on the battlefield. As Krishna reveals himself in his awesome splendor, Arjuna recognizes the disparity of their wills and intentions. Krishna commands Arjuna's respect, speaking the famous lines, I am time, the mighty cause of world destruction who has come forth to annihilate the worlds even without any action of yours. All of these warriors who are arrayed in the opposing ranks shall cease to exist. And then he continues to say, um, they have already been struck down by me. Be the mere instrument, Arjuna. So Arjuna's understanding of his role matures. No longer can he see himself as the unrealized cause of wrongful death, he has been directed to the understanding that death isn't his to enact, but that he is Krishna's acts instrument and does not have a causal nature. 
Arjuna gains clarity of vision, and despite his accomplishment as an archer and a warrior, he is merely that instrument of Krishna's will. And Krishna further comforts him, saying, Absorbed in Brahman, he whose self is serene does not mourn, nor does he desire impartial among all beings, he attains supreme devotion to me. So finally, Arjuna, understanding his relationship to Krishna, and thus gaining insight into the previous, his previously deluded beliefs about himself, his life, and his will, recognizes but does not yet act upon his warrior dharma. And he concludes, my delusion is destroyed and I have gained wisdom through your grace, Krishna. My doubts are gone, I shall do as you command. So now possessing a more complex and mature understanding of death, Arjuna still must address how he will or will not construct a meaningful life. So we move ahead to this idea of what is a meaningful life. Arjuna doesn't act at the end of the Bhagavad Gita. He merely, has, he merely has come to a greater understanding of death that will allow him to begin to live his life with this new understanding, to construct that life. So um, for all of us, given a greater understanding of death, our aim would still be the construction of a meaningful life. So I use Frankel's work, Man's Search for Meaning, as a guidebook here. The book recollects his experiences as a prisoner in German concentration camps and presents the basis of his therapeutic logotherapy. A stunning recurring character theme and character is the Jewish capo. This entity can be used to explore how life is pursued, how life, when pursued as its own, can lack value and meaning. Um, for some background, capos were Jewish prisoners who took on the role of pseudo guard or enforcer. They managed and punished other prisoners, and for this, they were rewarded with the tenuous opportunity to hold on to their own life. The paradox of the Jewish capo is how they place their survival, their pursuit of life above everything else. And this, capa this capability was an underlying characteristic that led to their acquiring the role of capo in the first place. Franco Frankel expresses this paradox, writing that only those prisoners could keep alive who, after years of trekking from camp to camp, had lost all scruples for their fight for existence. They were prepared to use every means, honest and otherwise, even brutal force, theft, and betrayal of their friends in order to save themselves. So the very capacity to single-mindedly pursue life resulted in enduring unbearable lives. So here we see as an example, an example that we can contrast to Arjuna with the valuing of life for life's sake. There's a pursuit of life for life's sake in its starkest and most naked form results in what can only be described as a non-life. For the capo, striving for life did not result in a life well lived, only in a brutal existence. So again, I reiterate that the, this knowledge of death must underlie the capability to a meaningful life. And um, I move ahead to this idea of ashrama. Ashrama coincides with the Hindu concept of dharma, perhaps translated as obligation, and varna, somewhat of a controversial topic, and I'll consider it here as established class. Ashrama are stages in life. And I suggest that we can use the ashrama system to see life as a series of discrete stages each with its own intention and its own purpose. Each stage begins and ends and then leads to another stage of life. We can almost see ashrama as a miniaturized and finite version of samsara, the cycle of rebirth. We begin each stage, we come to the end of each stage, but everything that has occurred in each stage sets us up for what will happen in the next one. In each stage, um, it each, each stage produces tiny samskaras, subliminal inference that become the potential causes for our actions and reactions. And the experience of regret in later life is a common construct in death investigations. And I'd like to suggest that viewing life in this way as a series of discrete stages can help alleviate regret over life as it was lived, things done and not done, providing a way to construct intention for each stage. The two ashrama relevant to this work are the householder and the retiree, the, um, the forest dweller or the hermit. The householder directs attention to family life and the householder's life will include accruing and interacting with worldly concerns of maintaining a household. 
the hermit forest dweller does not turn his back on the world, but begins a withdrawal from the world, turning over worldly concerns to the next generation. And these two uh, ashrama, the householder and the retiree, coincide nicely with middle age and retirement as we know it. The discrete division of purpose creates a space for contemplation of retirement to consider and address neglects from previous life staging, allowing regret to become an opportunity. And so as we look back in life in later years, regretting, becoming anxious over things that we did and things that we didn't, we can start to use that as a way perhaps to set ourselves up for contemplating and creating the meaningful life in later years. So in this presentation, I, um, it, I advanced the view of death that makes it intentionally constructed. I hoped to flip the class, so to speak. In a flipped classroom, students interact with the lecture and course materials on their own. They come together under the professor's eyes to engage in exercises and practice that reinforce and ingrain the content. Flipping the relationship between death and life allows death to become the lecture and life to become the practice, suggesting that en enriching the relationship with death allows one to gain mastery over life, makes, a cult makes cultivating relationship with death the primary activity of life. Witnessing Arjuna learn to abandon his death, his view of death as an abstracted and not yet realized possibility, we come to see that death is not the fearful outcome of life. The cycle of rebirth is the fearful outcome. Arjuna had his friend and companion, a personal guide to lead him to a deeper knowledge of death itself. And we have his story and other Dharmic teachings. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Judith. Um, I'd like to open it up. If anyone has any questions or comments, please feel free to jump in. Have I released the screen? No, we still see your screen. Okay, I see. Okay, I'd like to jump in with a question if I could. And the question Please. is geared toward a section that you did not have time to cover. But if you could just give a sentence or two about the Jain practice of Salekana. Sure. So Salekana. This is so Jainism is is one of the, the Dharmic traditions that I look at in the um, in the thesis. And one thing that Salekana does, Salekana is the practice of voluntary and intentional suicide, um, starvation to death. It is not really the same as suicide in that number one, its practice is um, does not come from despair, but comes from um, cleansing one, an, an opportunity to cleanse oneself of karma accumulated in life through the practice of pursuing this death. Salekana cannot be undertaken lightly. It requires the, um, the, the permission of, um, of Jane higher ups than the, than the practitioner. It used to uh, be in the, in the realm of the Jane monks, but lay people can also um, practice salekana. Typically, a person who seeks salekana is somebody that's perhaps in advanced ages of age of life where they can no longer perform duties of life. Um, somebody experiencing um, the stages of, of terminal illness. So salekana by uh, intentionally depriving oneself of food and drink is a way of cleansing oneself. <coughs> karma accumulated over death, uh, over life. Um, another aspect of Salekana that's very interesting is that it's a, it's a the entire community is involved in it. It's not something that a person goes away to do, but it's something that, that brings community together. The Salekana practitioner can become something of, let's say, a saint or a, a great person 
as they end their life and it becomes an honor to interact with, to, um, to participate and support that person as they approach the end of life. I don't know if had a more specific point that you wanted. No, that, that was a good summary. Thank you. Sure. Judith, I had a question. This is Chris Miller. I, I, I saw it, but thank uh, you Chris, for speaking up. Yeah, I'll just say um, I, I would like to hear because I know we've talked about this a bit in office hours and in my office about how you might use this practice uh, or how you might bring this to the people following graduation and uh, kind of what you intend to do with it. I remember you mentioning maybe trainings, um, these types of things. So I'm just curious to know uh, what, what you're up to. Sure. So um, I'll just give a bit of background. Um, when I came in the program, I had the intention of, um, of going to an end of life doula training and incorporating that into my, um, my life journey as a way to serve and um, to bring um, and to incorporate yoga practices into it. Last summer, I had an opportunity to go to Denver and do the end of life of doula training through, an through one of the organizations that does trainings. And while I was at the training, I, I found that the end of life doula work didn't really resonate with me. It seemed um, the, the focus was on um, helping, giving, bringing comfort helping people find meaning as their death is eminent, as they are actually at the end of life. Frequently doula work takes place in um, hospices, um, convalescent hospitals, et cetera. And while I was in the training, I, really, I started thinking that rather than working with somebody at the very end of life to construct an artifact of a way they'd like to be remembered, that it would be really um, a great opportunity to start working with the end years of life to construct that so that when somebody actually approaches the end of life, they don't have regret. They have created the life and, the, and, the, and they have manifested and realized the vision of themselves that they want people to remember. So that's what started the, um, that's what made me start thinking about this particular thesis. And I'd really like to incorporate this, um, this the schema, these thoughts, these dharmic um, traditions into a series of workshops going um, addressing um, given at places like um, schools that support um, lifelong learning, um, community centers, community colleges, places like that. A series of workshops that offer um, that develop and offer exercises that help uh, that help us and participants start to explore death. And through that exploration of death, right, come to an, an understanding of, of how, of what their, what their life can be, and then um, start to create that. So putting together workshops, incorporating that into um, yoga classes that I hope to have the opportunity to teach, those are outlets that I foresee for, for this. That's great. I, I think right now more than ever, there's a huge societal reflection on death, then this could be something really important to take on a, on a really broad scale. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll look, I don't know if there are any other questions. Well, we've been reading through the comments here, uh, at least I have, and um, everyone, I think I want to echo what people have been saying, you know, the wonderful work and difficult work to, to do this kind of project. Um, you know, we know for me, uh, meeting Judith for the first time, we bonded over our love of cats and also, you know, Judith does a lot of this work with, with cats that are in the last stage, in fact, and any pet owner will know that in a way what the pets are doing is preparing us for our own death. We know when we invite them into our life that they're going to die, uh, probably before us. And we have to de generate somehow that love, that compassion, and that courage. And that is courage that we will need for ourselves and for others also. So um, I can't help but think that Judith has found a way of expressing her own version of, of what the Buddhists call uh, great compassion, something that's shared not just uh, among Buddhists, but all traditions um, in Christianity too, uh, with Jesus. So, uh, I want to just express, you know, how much, uh, how moved I am by what Judas has done. 
and um, congratulations uh, to you on a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you to Yoga Studies for the opportunity to pursue this work. It's been, it's been a wonderful opportunity. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Judith, I had the great pleasure of being able to present you with your superlative this year. And um, like I did last year, I just want to, uh, I'm going to give you a mantra. I gave students mantras last year that, that I gave the superlatives to. So uh, I'm going to read it in Sanskrit first, and then I'm going to read the translation and a little something, um, a little dedication to you after that. It's from the Bhagavad Gita. And um, as you can see here, we are presenting you with uh, the Seva superlative. So I hope this makes sense to you. I think it will after your wonderful presentation. Karmanye vadikaraste, makale shukadachana, ma karma palahe turbur, mate sangos du karmani. Your right is to action alone, never to its fruits at any time. Never should the fruits of actions be your motive. Never let there be attachment to inaction in you. Over the past two years, you have dedicated body, mind, and soul to your yoga studies, the Yoga Mindfulness and Social Change Program, and to your fellow cohort and students. Your ability to engage course material with keen and original thinking always made the graduate classroom a delight for us all. So many of your peers' papers improved dramatically from your penetrating editorial eye. And you yourself, after only one year of graduate school, presented a paper at the American Academy of Religion, a truly remarkable accomplishment. My fellow vegan yogini companion in spirit, your selfless service, devotion and reverence has made us proud and has uplifted us all. May you continue to bring your light of service into the world, not only for those who live well, but now based on your new research, for those who ponder their mortality. I hereby bestow you, Judith Carlisle, with the superlative seva for your unending selfless service, devotion, and reverence. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really, really touched, and I appreciate it a great deal. So thank you to all of my classmates, all the faculty, it's been the best. I've learned so much. I've had such a life-changing and growing experience. So thank you for recognizing that in this way. 